and the race to build an atomic bomb, who was left behind in the pursuit of a false sense of security. This story starts in 1945 with one man, J. Robert Oppenheimer. But the people affected total in the millions, and the fall of that decision continues to this day. Throughout this season, we will look at the shadow left behind by Oppenheimer and the lives that exist within that shadow. Impacted communities, nuclear workers, and more. We will also look at the ways in which pop culture, specifically the Christopher Nolan film, tends to focus solely on the man and not those left behind in the shadow. I'm Angela Kellett, and this is The Shadow of Oppenheimer. Last episode, we talked about how the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Only three days later, on August 9, 1945, the U.S. dropped a 21-kiloton plutonium device known as Fat Man on Nagasaki. Fat Man detonated at an altitude of 1,650 feet over Nagasaki, with a yield of 21 kilotons, about 40% more powerful than Little Boy, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The impact was devastating, particularly because people had heard the all clear from an earlier aircraft raid warning and had left their shelters that day. Everything within a mile of ground zero was destroyed. 14,000 homes burst into flames. People close to the blast were vaporized, and those unlucky enough to just be outside the radius received horrific burns, and there and further out, radiation poisoning would eventually kill many. Although estimates vary, perhaps 40,000 people were killed by the initial detonation. By the beginning of 1946, 30,000 more people were dead, and within the next five years, well over 100,000 deaths were directly attributed to the bombing of Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. What was once thought as unimaginable happened twice in under a week. And those like Dr. Massimo Tamanga, who was just two years old at the time of the bombing of Nagasaki, remembers it vividly. I remember when I was age five, I walked around the Urakami area, which was mainly destroyed by the bomb to visit Dr. Nagai's Nyokodo, small room for his family. And I walked around the ruin of Urakami Cathedral. That is my greatest memory when I was a child. I was luckily uh, uh, taken out of the broken house and then soon burned out. My mother took me out of this uh, broken Japanese wooden house. So at the time I was only two years or two months. So there was no memory about it. Only mother's uh, memory is my memory. <laughs> so we escaped from our uh, broken house at the 11 uh, Around 11.05, uh, my mother took me quickly to a nearby shrine and spent there one night. Uh, we were uh, given uh, pieces of rice bowl to eat. That was our family, my mother and me, uh, all memory at the first time, first uh, day of atomic bombing. My father was uh, in Taiwan uh, to serve uh, Army Air Force. Years later, Dr. Tamanga graduated from Nagasaki University Medical School, where he specialized in internal medicine and hematology. He was the director of the Japanese Red Cross Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Hospital and engaged in research on the after effects of atomic bomb radiation on human health. Throughout the years, he saw countless patients who had atomic bomb related diseases in the Hibakusha. This is a term used for those who survived the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We call them uh, Hibakusha. I've been uh, working for them uh, as a physician. Mainly I treated uh, those Hibakusha who developed uh, leukemia. I have seen so many uh, leukemia patients. That was my life, all life, since I became a physician, a hematologist. It has passed 78 years since then, so almost 80,000 
survivors, hibakushas, are getting older and older. Of course, they are dying from various kinds of diseases. Most diseases are the similar diseases we Japanese elderly people suffer, but sometimes atomic bomb radiation related diseases such as lung cancer, breast cancer, and leukemia, and, and very peculiar disease, myelodysplastic syndrome. It's a kind of uh, leukemia uh, when old people suffer. For a long time, the such a long time continuation of uh, atomic bomb radiation related diseases still occurring after a uh, half century. The fact that so many radiation related diseases are still occurring decades after the fact prompted Dr. Tamanga and others to look at the why. How the disease developed inside the Hibakusha bodies, which was just suddenly irradiated in 1945. That was our uh, great question. So we practiced uh, many clinical analysis and experimental analysis, and we reached the conclusion that the first atomic bomb radiation hit human body, and most of the cells inside the uh, organs, such as lung, heart, uh, uh, stomach, colon, etc., and bone marrow in case of atomic uh, bomb induced leukemia. The genetic event, which means uh, uh, DNA damage. So such a uh, important uh, DNA was damaged by the first hit of atomic bomb radiation. Such DNA damage induces gene abnormality. Sometimes such gene abnormalities led to carcinogenesis. It's the induction of cancer inside the body. So it took a half century, such a long period. Dr. Tamanga has been working as a physician for over 70 years and has spoken at length about the health impacts on the hibakusha, how it was impacting them at the time and how it continues to impact them to this day. This is one way of continuing to share the stories of what happened in Nagasaki. Others have used art as a means to cope with their grief and to continue to share the stories with the masses. The use of art to share stories of the Hibakusha is a powerful vehicle to share stories. It's also an opportunity to connect with artists and survivors. This community has taken immense tragedy and turned into something so much more. And there are countless other ways in which those in Japan have used art to share their stories and to share their grief. Art is something that connects everyone in different ways, something that is so important when it comes to sharing the stories of those who are no longer with us. There are so many different means of communicating what happened in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Art is a prominent example. Another example is through social media campaigns like the Cranes for Our Future campaign. The campaign asks individuals to post pictures of paper cranes with a wish for a safer future. As we discussed in last week's episode, this is drawn from the story of Sadako Sasaki, a young girl who survived the bombing of Hiroshima only to pass from leukemia a few years later. While she was sick, she folded a thousand paper cranes. According to Japanese tradition, if one folds a thousand paper cranes, you can make a wish, and Sudaku wished to live. While she didn't get her wish, her story continues to inspire countless people to make paper cranes and wish for a safer world. The Cranes for Our Future campaign is one example of how Sudaku's story is still inspiring people to this day. Ravi Garla is a strategic communications consultant at the Nuclear Threat Initiative and he runs the Cranes for Our Future campaign. The campaign uses creative storytelling means to raise awareness online about the threat of nuclear weapons and what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's this quote that I might garble that has stuck with me, but it was something that the Nagasaki mayor actually said uh, was that the, the, tr- the strongest or the true deterrent against nuclear use are the voices of the Hibakusha. And all those that lift them up, that is something I might add to that. Um, you know, as the memories of these these events fade into the, the past and the survivors themselves are in their 80s, it's really up to us to kind of tell this story in new and different ways and, and the ways in which people are consuming it. You know, one, one thing that in a totally different vein is Nuclear Threat Initiative has conducted kind of audience research in the U.S. Um, about where people, when they're not 
paying attention to nuclear weapons or getting their news and information. Um, and when we look at particularly those that are the most persuadable on our issue set, they're the least likely to be watching cable news and the most likely to be getting their information from YouTube, TikTok, and other social media. And so where we're trying to push is not necessarily where it's easiest for nonprofits or most natural for nonprofits to be, but really where the people we want to reach are. I'd also say like this is kind of an insight that I, I think that no one has really fully utilized, but also the people that are most persuadable, they're also interestingly enough content creators in their own right in this generation in general. We, we followed a panel of Americans in terms of what websites they reached and websites that stuck out were Canva and um, YouTube Studio, which is where creators go on their channels to help you know push content. And so these people are storytellers naturally, and really uh, organizing today should be about how might we organize those that are natural storytellers um, on things that are meaningful to themselves or, you know, on, on sharing kind of um, the stories of survivors and, and lessons from history. Sharing stories through different techniques is key to not only honor those who have been affected by nuclear weapons, but to also help people grasp the broad concepts of nuclear weapons their existence and the threat they pose. Art is a way to do this because it allows people to visually make their own connections to the issue. You know, I, I think one thing any movement has to do is share its aspirational vision and art and fiction in this respect have lots of powerful tools to do that in ways that it's, it's difficult to do in any other format. Um, and when you think about nuclear weapons, it's hard to think of positive symbols, you know, I think the peace sign maybe, but cranes, you know, it, those are two powerful symbols that this movement has created. And we, we really wanted to figure out a way, how might we reinforce and strengthen that symbol's relevance for nuclear disarmament, imbue it with meaning. And, you know, there's NTI or, you know, organizers that generally are just not good at this type of uh, communication. And so, we want to invite people where that is their skill set and artists to, to reinterpret the symbol and why it's relevant today. The latest iteration of the Cranes for Our Future campaign saw street art across popular cities. This art was a means for storytelling when it comes to complicated topics like nuclear weapons. The um, manga art that Gigi Murakami created um, for this year's Cranes for Our Future campaign is a great example. You know, we had like a really tough brief of like, how might, you know, on the heels of Oppenheimer, could you connect the story of the birth of the bomb with the, the challenges we face today and relate it to kind of Sadako's story and the story of the crane, which, you know, I actually didn't know the answer of how you might do that, but I think she did it beautifully. Um, and, you know, at the core of that story, she she put like kind of our agency in shaping what our future is and the different paths we can take. That's that's why on art, I think on a more practical sense as well, you know, we origami folding is not necessarily everyone's jam. You know, we we wanted to provide this campaign is a we want to give many different tools for people to express themselves. Um, and uh, rather than just kind of some, you know, graphic that some graphic designer created, we we wanted to create. It's one of the many things we do every year is experiment. And last year was the first year we we commissioned artwork uh, related to the campaign to a paper crane um, by Jeff Nishinaka, um, who who has his own connection to uh, the story of Hiroshima um, and the bombing. And so we. We wanted to kind of how might we use artists that have their own connection and could could share it and, and reinvent it in different ways and give people the ability on the anniversary. You know, some people only have a minute that they will spare for between their busy lives. And we want to make it as simple as possible for people to show, you know, that they too support this vision or cause and why it matters to them. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki seemed impossible until they weren't. 78 years later, it's vital that these stories continue to be shared and remembered as survivors continue to pass. Art is one way the community continues to share the stories with the world and honor the lives of survivors. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week with our final episode of the season, talking about the ways in which popular culture talks about nuclear weapons. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Angela Kellett and Jacqueline Shing. 
Our theme song is Black Nymph by Peridot. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.